two. Hey everybody, my name is Corey Miller. I'm host of the Integrative Life Centers webinar series and I've got Greg Kafori, Director of Emissions for Integrative Life Center here with me today. And we're gonna be talking about uh, treatment. We're gonna be talking about uh, the ILC program and taking your questions along the way. So before I get started and talk, tell you a little bit about Greg and start to hear his story, uh, there's a button at the bottom of the Zoom app that says Q&A. Hit that, hit that button and you can ask questions, including anonymous questions during the webinar. Um, here's how the webinar is kind of going to lay out. I'm going to introduce Greg and ask him to tell you his story. He's got a, a very compelling story that really, uh, when I first heard it back in the fall, Greg, I was just like, wow, what first I love the transformation in your life, but also that you were the person that welcomes people uh, into the program at IOC. I mean, your passion just sh and purpose and calling for what you're doing is just incredible. Then we're going to talk about uh, what to look for in a treatment program and specifically talk a little bit about IOC uh, and then take your questions. Uh, by the way, when we start to talk about uh, program fits, I know someone's already asked a question here. Uh, we're going to talk about from a therapist or mental health professional that refers clients to ILC. And also for those of you that might be considering treatment, um, also try to answer those key questions that Greg and his team answers quite a bit. All right, Greg, thanks. I know you've been <laughs> busy is not a word to describe how you've been. I know you've just been like drowning uh, right now in work uh, and the good work you do, but uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Corey. Thanks, man. I'm glad to be here. Well, uh, it's so great uh, hearing your story, hearing your passion for ILC. It was like we have to get you on here and share uh, even more broadly than you do. So, how I want to get started is really to ask about your story and your background, um, what didn't work, what did work, uh, and uh, I'll just turn it, uh, let you kind of tell your own story there. Yeah, all right. well, I appreciate it. I um, haven't gotten to do this in a little while, so I'm, I'm excited. You know, I talk to people on the phone every day, right, people who are interested in coming to ILC or who are curious about it and what we do and who we are, and um, I get to share a little bit of my experience, but anytime that I get to really talk about my journey as a whole, um, I get excited. It's, it's uh, uh, like you said, man, it's been a little bit of a transformation for me, um, start to finish. And I guess I'll start at the beginning. Um, I, uh, I was born uh, the oldest of four, four uh, kids as a busy family <laughs> um, up in the DC region, Northern Virginia region. And um, I had a very fortunate upbringing. I mean, I think I had loving parents and, and loving siblings and I had a family that, um, you know, in, in my understanding at least was very, very happy and very blessed. Um, you know, and, and, and my childhood, as far as I can remember, it was, was uh, bright and, and full of optimism. And uh, I, you know, as I grew up, I, I did the things that, that young boys do. I got in a little bit of trouble, maybe a little rambunctious side to me there. But for the most part, I'm a pretty, if there's such a thing as normal, right, a pretty normal childhood, I would say. Um, and about, at about 11, 12 years old, I can't remember exactly. And I actually only remember this because of the work that I'll eventually talk about, you know, going through and working on. Um, but at, at about 11 or 12, I remember my parents bringing me into their bedroom. Um, you know, being the oldest of four, sometimes they would use me as the, as the um, guinea pig, right, for certain things, and also the, the role model for the younger ones. And um, I remember my mom and dad pulling me into their bedroom and telling me that my mom was very sick and that they didn't know what that meant. They didn't know if that meant she was going to, that she wasn't going to be okay. And there was just a ton of fear and uncertainty. I could, I could read it in my dad's face, which was not something I was used to. Right. I had always, I mean, a father to a young man is, is the model right? For what a man is and what is a, man, a man should be and can be. And I'd never seen him display fear that way and uncertainty that way. Um, so it was, it was a little bit of a, of a traumatic experience and I had never considered it that, but it, it, 
it is certainly in retrospect and in hindsight, you know, I, uh, I remember them telling me, Hey, Greg, we're telling you this. We don't want you to tell the other kids. We need you to be strong for them, right? Like take this role of, of leader amongst the, the kids and the family. And the, so, Hey, that was a little bit um, scary. Right. But the real thing I remember now thinking about at that time was that it was the first time I'd experienced any kind of real fear that my mom might not be around that, that this world I'd grown up in, which was at that time, very lucky, very fortunate, you know, didn't, didn't, ex I hadn't experienced tremendous loss, um, that the world wasn't a perfect place, you know, um, that there were things I couldn't control, things I couldn't understand, um, that scared me. And that, that came with a bunch of, um, uh, sadness, uncomfortable emotion. And I literally remember now, I, like I said, this is in, in retrospect and I'll, I'll get to the rest of this, but I remember now at that time being 11 years old or whatever it was thinking, Oh, this is, this does not feel good. And I'm going to avoid ever feeling this way again. Um, and at the time I literally can remember myself separating, um, disconnecting from my family purposefully, semi-consciously, you know, consciously saying, well, if I get, if I'm very close to people and those people can be taken away from me and I don't like that feeling, then what I need to do is make it so that I don't stay really close to people, which is an absurd thought now, right? But to a young boy who was being asked to, to act like a man and was being exposed to things that were really scary at the time, uh, just, that's just how, how I, how I rationalized it. Um, and you know, now, now working in recovery and being, being somebody who struggled with addiction, and we'll get to that part of the story in a minute, I realized that disconnection and separation are, 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 are parts of that, right? They're, they're parts of what make addiction grab hold of you. They're parts of what makes struggle real, is that we disconnect, you know? Um, and that was the start of it. I, 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 I now know, looking back, that basically since that time as a young, young boy, I almost said young man, which is part of my work to rationalize that that was not something a young boy should, should have to think about and deal with. But I, I started to put on a mask. I put on a mask of, of what I thought everybody wanted to see. I put on a mask of who I was supposed to be in the family, but really inside I was a totally different person. And it, and it was reflected in, in the way that I lived for the next 16 years of my life, basically from, from 12 to 28, 29, 30 years old, I lived a life where I presented one way, but felt another, you know, like the analogy that I use is something, it's like a, like an iceberg, right? You know, the, the, you can see just the tip of the iceberg and the tip, you know, it's, it's beautiful, right? <laughs> Especially in certain lights. Um, but underneath it is much more expansive and a, a piece of the puzzle that people just don't see. Um, and so that reflected itself. I, I went and I, I put on my mask. I, I was very successful, you know, on paper. I was a, a lot of people don't know this actually. And if there's anybody listening that, that does know me, they'll find this funny. I was a, um, a Latin champion in middle school and high school. If there is even such a thing, <laughs> there's a competitive world to Latin. Um, I was a, you know, an athlete, a successful, a successful student. And, and on paper, all of that looked great, right? And, then, and, it, and it fit the mold of the culture I grew up in too, which is the that DC, Northern Virginia, very ambitious culture. Um, there's a path set for young boys that grow up in that area. And the path is you, you do well as a young person, you go to college, you do well there, you get a, a great job and you start a family. It's just do, 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 right? Um, and from what everyone can see, that's what I was doing. But inside I was scared and insecure and, you know, uncertain. And it all started with that, that uncertainty that I experienced as a young boy. All of this I had no idea about, right? This is all now having gone through my journey, but what, what in actuality in the story, what happened was because I was, you know, presenting one way, but feeling another, that was an untenable situation for me. Um, and so I started to experiment with drugs and alcohol. I, um, I, you know, at a, at a young age started doing what most young people do in America, which is unfortunate, but started, you know, drinking a little bit, smoking a little bit of marijuana. Um, 
and and that ramped up and it ramped up and it ramped up and 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 by the time I got to college I was a um a daily drug user a daily drinker but able to to you know concurrently succeed right so I was able to manage you know masking and medicating all day long but presenting at least uh you know as much as I could handle as a successful young man you know I was I was um I did well in college. I left school and I became a, a high school Latin teacher and, um, you know, was successful at that. And during that and, and into my early 20s, what happened was it got harder and harder to reconcile the mask I was wearing in the, in the inside. You know, what, what people were seeing was this, this you know, decently successful young man. Um, but what they didn't see was that in order to maintain that I was, my drug use was ramping up, um, pretty, pretty drastically. Um, by the time I hit my mid twenties to late twenties, I was, uh, I was using drugs at, at a, at a rate that, that is, um, shocking to some, um, to those of us who, who work in the treatment world, it's a story that's sadly too common, you know? Um, and, and, you know, was slowly, I, I use the word degenerating, right? Like I, 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 I started to, my work life started to suffer. My relationships started to suffer. Um, I, I got married in my early twenties and, uh, and had a long, long relationship that was um, pretty unhealthy, you know? And, and, and that is a result of the, the lifestyle that, that, that we, that I was living, um, you know, in order to, to cope and, and, and in the end, you know, by my mid twenties, late twenties, I had um, gotten to a point where I was starting to live a life that what I, I wasn't able to present the way that the, that the people had been used to seeing me present. Right? I wasn't able to act my way through life, which is such a tiring, exhausting way to live. You know, <laughs> um, it's one of the lessons I've learned is that 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 lifestyle that a lot of us get caught in of, of presenting one way and, and feeling another is, is exhausting, you know? Um, so I, uh, I got to a point where I was introduced to, um, opiate painkillers, Oxycontins. Um, and uh, it's such a, it's such a sick way to think at the time, but I was like, this is the answer, right? This, this drug allows me to feel None of the uncomfortability that I hate feeling. Uh, it allows me to feel like Superman. I can go out there and I can be the guy that everybody needs me to be and also be really high. Um, and, and it started off there and very quickly turned into a serious, serious problem. Um, you know, that drug is, the opiates in general are, uh, are like all drugs. Um, they're progressive in the nature in which you use them and in the nature in which they can take a hold of you. Um, very quickly, this will sound shocking to some, I was, um, I was spending on average 300 to $800 a day on, on those drugs, um, which for people, you know, which for anyone is too much money, right? Um, I switched careers at the time. I, I had uh, entered the corporate world. I was doing commercial real estate development and, brokerage and, and, um, you know, had the funds for a little while to make that happen, but, but it got a hold of me in a bad, bad way. Um, I stopped paying my mortgage and lying to my wife about it. I, uh, crashed a car or two. Um, you know, it just got progressively worse and worse and yet I couldn't stop. And if it wasn't those, if I could stop those, it was something else. It was this need to feel, sated if that you know what i mean sated it was it was a need to to escape uncomfortability to to medicate and and it culminated with uh with everyone around me realizing that i had you know i was down a path that was dark and i needed some help um so uh my family asked me to go to treatment and i did i went to a treatment center um a, a very well renowned treatment center that that specializes in alcohol and drug treatment um and I walked in the door and it just didn't feel right. I, I was, I was um, approached with this mentality that I was defective, that I was wrong. 
You know, at least that's the way I interpreted it. When I walked in the door, it was like, you're an addict. You are flawed grievously. Right. And here's the answer. Um, and there was one answer presented to the 30 of us that were in that room at the time when, when they, when, when I walked in the door and it didn't resonate, it didn't feel right. It, 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 like what was missing for me was an explanation. I wasn't looking for an excuse. I, I mean, at the time I probably wasn't ready to really take accountability for my, for my life and my actions, but still I wasn't looking for an excuse. What I was looking for was an explanation. I wanted to understand why someone who, I mean, inside, I didn't feel like a drug addict, right? Like I felt like, like a decently intelligent, semi-articulate, right? Like athletic dude who could, you know, like uh, succeed in life and, and, and who had maintained a, a pretty successful life on paper. And all of a sudden it felt like that had all fallen apart and everyone was telling me that I was flawed and it didn't feel right. Um, and it didn't work. You know, that treatment experience didn't work for me. I immediately bristled. I immediately became defensive to the idea that I had a problem. I immediately um, got defensive of the idea that I was inherently flawed. Um, and, and so it didn't take. And ironically I, ironically, I just put the mask right back on and pretended like it took and walked out the door and tried to convince the people in my life that I was okay. Um, and that held up for a tiny bit of time until it completely fell apart again because I hadn't actually healed in any way. I hadn't worked on anything. I had uh, once again acted my way through the experience. Um, and so I left and the story gets darker. <laughs> I, um, you know, I, this part is not, it's not really easy for me to talk about. I, um, I divorced my wife. I lost my house. I lost my car. I lost everything that was material around me, but I also degraded into the type of um, person that, that I didn't want to be. And, uh, you know, so my, my life really became about uh, lying and stealing and, I don't know. It's not even, it's not even easy for me to qualify in words. It was this weird period, um, you know, of about, of about a year and a half, two years where I lived the kind of addict life where the only thing I cared about was drugs. I completely cut myself off from everyone around me, changed my phone number, moved across the country, stopped talking to anyone in my family, completely isolated from my friends. It's that disconnection again, right? The same disconnection I was talking about that I had, that I had sort of planned. And, uh, and then I was involved in a car accident. Um, and it was a car accident where someone got hurt. Thankfully, uh, you know, nobody, it, it, it wasn't terribly serious from an injury perspective, but I, uh, it made me think about it, what it, what it, this is what it did. It made me, question the type of person I was in a way that I had never done before. And it, and it really brought to bear like this idea, like, you know, I, am I a bad person? Cause I don't like, I, don't, I didn't think I was, you know, I mean, even despite all of the bad behavior, I knew in my heart, I wasn't a bad guy, you know? Um, but that behavior is not the behavior of a good guy. Um, and so it, that experience really was sort of the, the they talk about people's bottoms, right? Or, or people's bottom line. The, the, um, I, that was the experience that, 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 that really shook me to my core and made me want to figure out what was going on, um, to find the explanation and maybe some help. Um, so I asked for it. And I asked for it from my family and they were supportive. Um, very blessed in that way. And they, and they, we started to look for treatment that felt right. So, so, you know, we did research, we, we looked around the country, we, we wanted to find, I wanted to find treatment that I thought would help me find answers and then would help me find healing. Um, and that's when I found ILC. Um, you know, and, and so not only am I the director of admissions, I'm, I'm an alumni, um, you know, and, and, and 
I had been through treatment before. I had, I had experienced, so there's sort of an, uh, um, an older modality of treating people in the treatment world, which is oriented around those things that didn't resonate with me, right? Those ideas of um, that you're born inherently flawed as an addict and, and that, that that's just the way it is. Um, and, 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 and no one can deny genetic predisposition to addiction. No one can deny the, the evidence that supports the idea that it is a disease, right? And I don't deny that. I have the disease of addiction, right? But to me, that isn't the whole story. And I was looking for the rest of the story and I needed help to figure that out. Um, and I found it, I also, what I experienced in, in my next attempt at treatment here, I also was that I didn't walk in the door and get labeled as an addict. What I walked in the door and they said, Greg, let's, let's talk about your life. Let's talk about your history. Let's talk about your childhood. Let's talk about your family. Let's talk about the story of your life and how it might shape the way you move in the world. Right. Like there's an analogy that my therapist here, who's still here, by the way, <laughs> I see on a, on a regular basis. Now uh, he uses this analogy regularly. He says, you know, when you're born, if you're, if you're born a car, you're born this, this beautiful color, whatever it is. Right. I like blue. So I'm this beautiful blue car. Right. And as you drive through life, you, you get bugs on the windshield and you roll through puddles of mud and the car becomes colored, right. Or discolored. It becomes covered up. And the events of somebody's life, of your life, right, they, they affect you. Um, and the coolest thing about what I learned at ILC was that when you start to explore that, right, and you explore why, the why behind your behavior, right, you can start to wash off the color that has changed your car, right? You can wash the bugs off the windshield. You can remove the, the mud. You can get to a point where you can discover the authentic you again, which for me is the crux of the story, right? It's like, I uh, didn't feel like I had been, like I had, I had been living as myself, truly. And so my journey at ILC was, yeah, it was about addiction. It was about behavior. It was about skills and treatment, but it was also about finding myself. It was about a, a, re, a, a recapitulation. And I, and I had a renaissance, literally, like in the most literal sense of the word, a renaissance, a rebirth, uh, you know, uh, uh, a discovery of the authentic Greg that had been, you know, somewhere in there the whole time and, and covered up. So that's my journey. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Here. Gosh, thank you, Gray. I mean, I know it's not uh, easy, but I know it's, it's part of your, your life and story and the authenticity you talked about. And specifically, I, I'd love that you shared it because you can say as a missions director and part of this te amazing team at ILC that you've been there, been through it, and now are trying to help people pull people in. And I think that's why I wanted you to share it because it's so compelling to the story. And it also talks about things that didn't work and things that did work. And that leads me to talk about um, the why, like you were talking about the explanation. Yeah. And it really sets up so, I mean, we could ask this question is what to look for in the treatment center. I, I think yeah. you had shared with me a lot of times people, I, I said specifically, you know, before in prep for this, what are some of the questions that people ask? Mm -hmm. But the foundational one that specifically, I know a lot of mental health professionals will ask. And I want to talk about this from that rational side, like the program made the difference for you. Can you share what some of those key things uh, to look for and connect those two also for how, ILC is set up and works. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, and you touched on this too. You touched on sort of the unique position I'm in, um, in that I've experienced ILC as a client, right? And so now I get the opportunity in my new role to help people come in to ILC as clients and experience it themselves. And, and I really feel really fortunate to be in that position. Um, you know, and, and when people ask me that question, particularly professionals they say you know what, what is the ILC program and how is it different I mean the, the we have as a as an overarching philosophy at ILC and this is what I experienced as well um, a concept that the disease model right 
doesn't tell the whole story that there are other pieces right and what and so with that in mind our goal is to explore a person through that lens through a trauma informed lens right and what does that mean that for us that means um you know exploring the underlying factors that drive behavior um you know pe for people who come to us who are struggling with addiction that's one thing but there are people who come to us they're struggling with mental health issues there are people who come to us they're struggling with process issues you know sex addiction issues and gambling issues and eating issues we have an eating disorder program right and our concept as a whole is that those are those behaviors are somewhat symptomatic right that what what is the root cause of those behaviors is what should be explored and processed and treated and through that lens we can treat everyone right and the concept becomes so how <laughs> you know from a program perspective we, we really attempt it in, in in i think three ways um and the and and the first and obviously a very integral part is you know evidence-based really strong clinical work you know master's level clini clinicians that are doing um you know they're that are employing therapeutic modalities that are um well known and effective um but also newer and 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 sometimes groundbreaking stuff um you know from a from a from the perspective of the types of things that we do clinically we're talking about you know skill stuff dbt and cbt skills but we're also looking from a trauma lens at you know using emdr using some somatic stuff uh, CRM, comprehensive resource modeling, is a, is a, is a new um, modality, a newer modality that can be really effective for trauma work. Um, you know, and, and so those things, those tools that our clinicians use, that makes up the, the clinical arm, right? The, 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 the one way in which we approach helping people. But there's this other really sort of unique thing about ILC that, that I fell in love with as a client. And that, uh, and that when I talk to people who are alumni in particular, um, that sometimes that they think, they think of this piece as sometimes the most impactful. Um, some, some programs call it a spiritual side. Like we, we like to term it experiential. Um, you know, there's a, there's a way of learning. There's a way of treating people that is different than just clinical therapeutic work. Um, and ILC does that in a really cool way. It's, it's a, I don't know. It's, it's, it's almost um, magical, right? Like we, we have a number of experiences that we want to expose our clients to that, um, that we hope they'll re that will resonate with them, right? That we hope they will take and make a part of their life going forward, right? Because when you come to treatment, you come to treatment to work on something, right? Um, and so in order to do that, you need to develop tools and skills and, and, a, and a plan, a wellness plan, right? For while you're here and for when you leave for the rest of your life. And, and every single person who comes to treatment is different. Every single person who comes to treatment has a different story, a different recipe of what brought them there. And, and so everybody's plan leaving, everybody's prescription, so to speak, should look a little bit different. And so we try to expose our clients to, um, you know, a multitude of experiential activities that they can then find something that works for them. We do uh, Native American sweat lodges. Um, we have a labyrinth on property that our that our clients can utilize, which is a it's a really beautiful ceremony. Um, a medicine wheel, um, breath work, which is incredibly powerful. I, I have seen clients um, really have incredible emotional breakthroughs in breath work sessions, and these types of things make up that sort of harder to qualify intangible side of ILC that in some ways is what really sets us apart. Um, yeah. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of people are going to be asking, is this the right thing for me? And, and you know, what I got for you from, from a couple of things you said, Greg, is that one, you're not going to get slapped a label yeah. when you get here. Yeah. <laughs> Another is not a generic one size fits all thing. I mean, I, I know we've, we've talked with art, art, the art therapist, Nina. Um, I know me McCormick, we've had on a webinar too, talking about the food and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how even gut health is a part of it. There's just a vast diverse, uh, like you said, the modalities and, and ways for treatment that you said is not just one size fits all, which is great. And the other one is 
holistic. Yeah. And I think that brings up, um, you know, ILC doesn't, it's just not this window. There's a full continuum of care yeah. that, that, so, that someone is being treated and helped and healing is going through. And can you talk to that just a second too? Yeah, absolutely. You know, what, we, what we've tried to build is, is the full continuum of care that we think works best right? Um, you know, it, there's a ton of evidence out there to support that the longer people are working on themselves in this type of setting, the better. Um, so what we've built is a residential primary level programming. Um, and then have in addition to that, the gradual step down programs that allow people to start with that really intensive primary work and then transition back out into hopefully the, the beautiful life they've always envisioned, right? Um, you know, and, and so what that looks like from a program perspective is three levels, a primary residential level of care, a partial hospitalization, PHP, and an IOP level of care. Um, and really, ideally, what we want to see is clients who stay with us for, for 90 days throughout that continuum. You know, because the, the high level is that starting point. It's where the work really begins, but it's not finished there. You know, the, 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 the key in our mind is continuing through and be, being able to practice the skills they've learned to have sort of one foot in remaining in the really good treatment and the continued care and one foot venturing back out. And right? so that, so it's not a, a huge jump from treatment to back out in the world. We want to make that a stepped down process. Oh, and, and I love that. And specifically of how, how I'll see does, does work. That's my dog. Sorry. Kids and dog. This is, this is the era of COVID here. Um, but you know, it, it lends to, and I've toured other facilities by the way, and this is vastly different. This is what's drawn to me to help work and support ILC and the work it does in the world. But I think often it's what does a day in the life uh, look like at ILC and I love the real aspect and you started in on that and I want to push you down that road for a yeah. second. Can you talk about that? What is a day in the life? What does a week in the life look like yeah. um, at IOC? Absolutely. You know, I'm at our residential level of care, what a day, what a, what a week looks like is seven days of treatment, right? It's a, it's that full, fully supportive environment. So our clients are on our residential campus which is beautiful, by the way. Um, and 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 on it on what the average day looks like is a, a full schedule. It's it, you, our clients are going to wake up, have breakfast. They're going to meditate, which is a big part of our process, right? It's one of those holistic pieces we think is really important. And then they're going to dig right into the work. Um, so from from essentially early in the morning until the the afternoon time, they're going to be in group therapy. Um, and that from a re at the residential level, what that looks like is about 35 hours of programming per week. So it's a pretty full schedule. In addition to that, each client is going to see their individual primary therapist twice a week. Okay. So, um, you know, from, from a, what's the day look like perspective, what you're talking about is a, is a full day of programming. And then in the evening, this is the fun part, um, communal, communal time, right? So we have, uh, in addition to, the, the incredible clinical work and the really cool experiential side of ILC, we've got this healing foods program, which we're really excited about. Um, and so our, our, all of the food that our residential clients eat comes from our, our farm. Um, and so it's all organic and it's all oriented at, at supporting a healthy lifestyle. And so the clients, after they're done doing their programming, after they're done doing their therapy, they're actually going to come together and cook and eat together in the home. And then on certain nights of the week, go and, and, and visit outside meetings, right? And during the time of COVID, that's a little bit different and we're adapting as everyone is. But, um, you know, when we talk about outside meetings, we're talking about community support. You know, one of the things that, um, that I talked about in my story and that we've found in, in, in healing in general is that people tend to be, to be unwell when they're in a silo and they tend to heal when they're in community, right? Um, and so there are a ton of community wellness programs that are out there. You know, there's 12 step programs, there's meditation based recovery programs, there's uh, smart recovery. It's a very analytical recovery program. And our concept at ILC is that we support our clients being in a community of people who are trying to be well. The really cool thing about ILC is that we don't 
impose one idea of what that looks like, right? Everybody who comes to treatment has a different story. We've talked about that, right? We all have a different background, different likes and dislikes, different ways of healing and, and, all, and all that. And so we want our clients to choose their wellness plan that fits them, right? And what that looks like in the evening is picking a community program to, to sort of round out their day. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. I think that's a big question. What people ask is, what does it look like when we get there? You know, I, yeah. I even have these stereotypes that are slowly kind of getting broken down. <laughs> what it looks like, yeah. and I have been to um, uh, what is the 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 residential? Uh, it's called, and I can't remember. I'm sorry, I'm stumped on it. The residential, uh, uh, Morning Star. Morning Star. Yes. And oh man, what a, an amazing setting! But it does. Yeah blend in a lot of modalities and just to kind of recap too and say um i mean clinicians you, you talked about master's level strong clinic i've mm -hmm. seen that over and over we've got webinars coming up by the way to share more uh of that work in the world we i put links to me mccormick's healing foods great uh, webinar we did last week and also mm -hmm. uh nina's art therapy work too the different modalities so i appreciate that too and and, and forgive me, I, I had a couple of distractions, but I know specifically ILC is real life, real world, real recovery. Mm -hmm. And that means something practically, which is a question you get asked a lot and rightfully mm -hmm. so is like from, from as simple as, you know, the question I would have is, can I keep my cell phone? Does that, mm -hmm. does that kind of, you know, there's even those type of fears, yeah. which is justifiable. And I love that kind of your mantra and ILC is real life or a world that you're trying not to just kind of, in a vacuum, I guess, is what the way I would think about it. Can yeah, about absolutely, Corey. I mean, I think um, this is something that makes ILC really, really unique. Um, you know, we've developed a, a philosophy around technology that's really, it comes from two perspectives. The first is that the people who are coming to us for treatment are adults. They um, need to be treated as such, right? And, and there's some accountability that comes with that. But the second one, the one that I think really drives our technology decision is that our world is a technological world now. We're on Zoom talking right now, right? The, the, the real world has cell phones and laptops and internet, and it has pressure. It has stressors. It has triggers. It has things that we can't deny exist, right? And a lot of times when people go to treatment in a bubble, uh, those things are, are – there's one thing – you know, in one way, that's very healthy, right, to, to get an escape right? For a little while and really work on yourself and be present. But in another way, there's a buildup. There's a buildup of emails and, and there's a, there's a buildup of pressure. And it's almost like when you step out of that bubble and you're exposed immediately to all of these things that exist right out there waiting for you, you haven't healed in a way that sets you up well to deal with that in the real world. And so one of our philosophies is, is, you know, like you said, real world, real life, real recovery. We want people to heal in a real world setting. And so we have decided that our clients will have a short period of time, uh, an acclimation period, so to speak, of 48 hours or so, um, where we ask them to, to, you know, turn in their technological devices and be present. But after that point, right, if it's clinically indicated, if it's agreed upon by them and their clinical team, our clients have their cell phones and there's wireless internet in the home. Um, and that is sometimes logistically a little difficult for us, but it, we think it, it promotes a, an environment where people can heal more effectively. Yeah. That's, that's, that's great. And I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so, Hey, if you have questions for Greg, he's given us a great overview and really dive in and so connected to story. I mean, we all connect with story and Greg, thank you for being vulnerable to share that. Uh, some of the comments that have come in is just thank you for your, sharing your story and opening up and mm -hmm. you're such a great model about that. But and also what a, what a great way to connect how ILC works to real life examples. Yeah. If, if you have questions, please post those in the chat um, and we'll be sure to get to those. Um, okay. So we, we talked a little bit about that, how I'll see where connected it to your story. There's a question that came in um, particularly, which is um, we, you mentioned COVID. We're in this world cool. of COVID. We're on Zoom. Um, I know ILC's pushed out virtual programs too, uh, but also testing specifically 
at uh, the residential areas. Um, but in your story, um, Beth asked, you talked about being disconnected. It appears that you figured out how to connect at IOC. How is IOC promoting connection during a disconnected world? Wow, that's COVID. such a great question. Yeah, that's such a great question. I'm going to answer the COVID testing piece first, and then I'll answer the connection question. The the COVID testing piece, we're really excited about. We've been, I think, at the forefront of this. For, for a month now, we've been testing any clients prior to their admission into ILC. And so before any client has been coming into the homes and joining the program, they're COVID tested. And we have access to, we work with a lab that has access to those tests, and we've been utilizing that almost since the beginning of the COVID era. Um, so we think that's a really exciting piece of our, of the plan we've put in place to keep our clients and our staff safe. Um, the connection piece is really exciting. We, we have adopted um, two, two ways that I'll answer that question. The first is that we have, because we've been able to COVID test anybody that's come in, we've been able to keep a safe environment. So our clinicians, our RA staff, our residential staff, and our clients are able to have face-to-face -face interaction on each campus, you know, the men's campus and the women's campus. Um, and so there's a lot of interaction going on. Our groups at the residential and PHP levels of care are happening in person. And that means that, um, that there's, there's a constant connection amongst the community of ILC. The connection outside of the community of ILC is where we get really exciting is because we have um, developed our telehealth programming. And so we're able to work with people who aren't in our homes. We're able to work with clinicians uh, as on a contract basis. We're able to bring in resources like art therapy and music therapy and other things like that from a telehealth perspective. And so you know, just like everyone, I think I heard Oprah say it. <laughs> um, one of the really cool things about just this. just invoked Oprah. I is, yeah, <laughs> I brought Oprah, man. Um, you know what? Uh, she said it. She's like, uh, they're, they're, you know, obviously finding positives in, in, this, in this, you know, terrible time yeah. is um, hard to do. But one of the things that has certainly been a result of the COVID era is that it's, it's, it's forcing us to find ways to connect with people that are new. Um, yeah. Utilizing and, technology, like you said. Absolutely. You know, and our clients have their cell phones, right? And, you know, and so they're FaceTiming with family. And we're, we're conducting programming via telehealth for IOP clients and for PHP clients that can't be in our homes. And so I think in those ways, we've really maintained a way to keep people in community, which is so yeah. important. And, and it goes back to the heart of what you're saying. And I've seen uh, in my last, I don't know, six months I've been around and even involved with IOC is it starts with healing. It starts with the work. Yeah. Uh, you even alluded to it when you started your story, you said when I was a young boy and you said, that's mm -hmm. kind of the work I do. I keep saying it, but you know, but, but that's where the center of it goes. And I know that particularly I'm glad you shared on the COVID test. Um, part that's real big and bold is it starts with the people and the healing and works from there which is incredible about ILC yeah okay if you have a question for Greg we got some time left and you can ask your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the zoom app right underneath our video here and you can do those anonymously as well um, real quick so while we're getting some of those questions Greg what would be a next step uh, if someone goes, okay, one, I'm a clinician or a therapist, mental health professional, and I'm referring somebody, you'd mm -hmm. answer that part. And then I'll follow up with the second question, which is someone goes, here I am, next step, Greg, tell me what to do. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And that's where, you know, in this new journey in my life where I'm situated, right? And, and it's a, like you said, it's a unique place to be. I feel really honored to be there because I've been through this journey myself. And so when I, when I get the chance to sit in the admissions chair and talk to people who are interested in coming, I feel a, a sense of uh, gratitude and, and, and responsibility around that. So for clinicians who are interested in potentially referring their clients to us, I'll tell you the way it's set up is uh, you'll get me on the phone <laughs> or one of my two colleagues. You know, we're, we're one of the really beautiful things about ILC is that we're a small family, right? A small family that's doing big work, I'd say. Um, and so our admissions team is three people. Um, and, and any clinician that has questions is, is welcome to reach out to us directly. Um, we work with the clinicians, we work with the families, we work with the, the, the potential clients themselves. Um, you know, and, and, and we each have our own story and we each have our own journey. And I think that clients really respond to that. 
um, I know I respond to it. You know, when I'm talking to somebody who's interested in coming to ILC, I get a chance to connect with that person in a way that's different than some stranger on the phone that they, that they, you know, they might be wearing a headset in a cubicle, right? Like it, it's a, it's a, it's a guy who's been there and has experienced it. Um, and so to get into your second question, you know, I mean, I think the, the, the first step is a call and it's the hardest step sometimes, you know, I, I hope that in, in anyone hearing this, you know, hearing the story that, that people feel that there's light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, you know, and that the, the voice on the other end of the phone um, is a friendly one who understands. And, and, you know, it's a scary thing to reach out for treatment, Corey. It's a scary thing to, absolutely. Yeah. To ask for help. Right. And you want it to be a personal experience. And that's our goal. You know, whether we're talking to a clinician or a client or a family member, there's a lot of fear, you know, and, and and it's, it's wrought with emotion. And so what we want to do is try to be a warm landing place for people who are seeking that help. Well, that's why I wanted to get you on the webinar to show that there's real humans at ILC and other treatment centers, of course. Right. Yeah. That, that there's real humans, backgrounds and stories connected to it. And that uh, trying to lessen that barrier of fear, like you, you, part of your story was first time, you know, family kind of saying, Hey, it's time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I should ask also about the family, mm. family or friends. I mean, that yeah. also are a part of the, sometimes destructions that's going on, um, the collateral damage, you know, yeah. can you talk to them for a second and say, you know, talk, you, I don't know, I, I yeah. want to lead you there and just say. I have, I, I do, I have thoughts. I mean, I, you know, having been, okay, so, and I'm not a clinician, right, but <laughs> just a person who's experienced this, but when so a family is a system you know a family is it's a system of pieces and when one piece is unwell it affects the entire system um and so part of the healing is obviously on an you know on an individual basis right for the client but it's amazing how that ripples out and can and can and can have results in healing the entire unit the entire family you know what we often see you see, this pandemic is a perfect uh, analogy, right? Disease spreads, right? We know that we're social distancing to, to prevent the spread of disease. But what I have found is that so does wellness, you know, so does, so does recovery. It was amazing what happened in my family when I worked on myself and got well. First of all, it inspired other people in my family to work on themselves, <laughs> but, but it was just, it was incredible to watch the ripple effect. You know, when, when, when one piece is broken, the whole system is broken. When you can fix the piece, you can fix the system. And so we at ILC, we try to do that in, in a number of ways, obviously by focusing on healing the client, right? That's the goal. Um, but we also have a family program, which we're really proud of and we think is integral to the process, right? Um, you know, there's no such thing as, 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 um, as healing in a silo. You're healing as a group. And so the family is a part of the healing process as a whole. Can you give me real quick, because I've got a question I want to ask you from, from our uh, actually anonymous came in. So can you give me a quick, what does the family look like? The family, family program? program? Yeah, absolutely. So our family program is a three-day program. Uh, for the family and for the clients themselves. Do you still have me there, Corey? I don't know if I froze or you froze. Uh, I can hear you now. You got me back? Yeah. All okay. right. Would you mind repeating that? I'm sorry. I didn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no problem, man. I mean, I, so it's a three day experience, right? And a fully therapeutic clinical experience. So our client, essentially it's, it's partly educational, but it's, it's very oriented around therapeutic processing, around healing for the whole family unit, you know, and it's designed in a way to, where well, the goal is to have the family leave with hope, right? I love that. Yeah, I love that. I mean, because there's so much uncertainty and fear 
when somebody comes into treatment. And a lot of times there's all this focus on that person. That, that person can feel almost like they're under a microscope, they're in a fishbowl, and the whole world is viewing and judging and criticizing them. And the goal is to have that, that, that perspective change. The perspective is not one of, of, you know, minute focus on one person, but rather on the healing of the whole family unit. And, and it's very cool to see what happens. You used a word there and it just the word I keep hearing through the entire webinar, which is whole holistic, yeah. like IOC is even programmed and thought through for uh, healing for the family too. And, and that's great. Okay, so a question came in, Greg, mm -hmm. uh, and, and before I ask the question, I'll say integrativelifecenter.com. You can pick up the phone and call. You can send an email, but integrativelifecenter.com will have, this will be on the site too, and just hit the, hit the contact us button, hit the call us button, and you can talk to someone at LLC, Greg, or one of his team um, to, to uh, take next steps. Um, okay, so Greg, uh, Anonymous asks, virtual programming is becoming more and more prevalent, especially with COVID. Do you think this is the future of treatment? Will more people try to do this as opposed to coming in person? Wondering how therapists can maintain, manage these expectations with clients that need a higher level of care. Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, I do think the world is changing uh, after this. I mean, I do think that, that technology is going to play a continuing role in treatment. Um, I don't think it's going to replace in-person, person-to-person healing, um, you know, which is why we have uh, attempted to blend the two. Um, but I think there's really exciting work that can be done from a, from a, a Zoom or whatever function, you know, technological perspective. There's a, right now we're connecting, right? Like I can see you and you can see me. And from a um, there's, you know, psychoeducational talk therapy, um, certainly didactic perspective, there's a ton of work that can be done and we can reach people that we couldn't reach before. That being said, I think that there, there are pieces that, that we still need to have that in person and experiential uh, angle, right? And that's where the things like the breath work and the sweat lodges and the, the labyrinth walk and these things that ILC has as resources for its clients are gonna be ongoing you know, post COVID. Yeah, good. Thanks for answering that question. Hey, everybody. I've been with Greg Cafori, IntegrativeLifeCenter.com, Director of Missions, sharing his per personal story, opening up, and also connecting to, been through ILC as a client, and now a Director of Missions, doing some amazing work helping welcome in new clients to the program and family and friends uh, about the journey. So if you have questions, please hit the Q&A app with the remaining time we have, and uh, we'd love to um, share those with Greg and let him answer those. This, will, this is being recorded, will be posted to integrativelifecenter.com afterwards. And as always, go there. If you have a question beyond this, you don't get answered, please pick up the phone for integrativelifecenter.com, hit the contact button, uh, and Greg and his team are there to help you. All right, Greg, as, as questions, uh, uh, as we're waiting for another question to come in, um, anything else that I missed or you want to share that we didn't get to touch on? I mean, we've covered a lot of ground here today. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, obviously I'm a biased <laughs> voice in this story. You know, I have a lot of love for ILC. And I think that as, I, as my career in the treatment industry grows, I've gotten a chance to um, to learn about programs all over the place that are doing incredible work. Um, uh, that being said, I think ILC is, is doing something that's unique. And I think the word whole is a part of that, like you mentioned. You know, our goal is to not to treat a behavior or fix a problem as much as it is, is to help someone find, you know, wholeness, centering, right? Like a reconnection to a happy, well life. And, and um, that's a hard thing to do. And then there's a lot of, uh, I'll say this to anybody who's interested in calling, you know, there's a lot of pride that we feel for people who make that call. You know, there's, there's, um, that's the first step and it's a hard one, but there's some honor in that and some courage in that. And hopefully if you call, we'll be the, the, the warm reception, warm voice on the other side because we've experienced it ourselves. What a great way to end. Um, 
let's see, we got a comment as soon as I said that, Greg. <laughs> uh, so one of our attendees live said, I'm so impressed with ILC. Greg is incredible and gives his entire heart to the clients that seek healing. I work with tre treatment centers all over the country daily, and they are by far the most unique and thorough program out there. They have adjusted to the changing environment very well. Thanks for sharing, Greg. You never shy away from sharing your story for the benefit of others. Thanks, Gary, for sharing that. That's a testimonial quote to go on the website for sure. <laughs> well, thank you, Gary. I, uh, I mean, I think, you know, like I, my, uh, I will, how about I'll end with this then? <laughs> I think, um, you know, it's not easy for me to tell some of the, the darker parts of my story. Um, but the, the, the renaissance that I have had, you know, the, 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 re, the, 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 the way that I found the life that I wanted to live, right? I want that for everybody else who's struggling right now. And so that's why I've decided to, to you know, make my career helping people get what they want and what they deserve, you know, which is a happy and well life. Thank you, Carrie and Corey and everyone else. Yeah. All right. IntegrativeLifeCenter.com. If you're listening to this later on, um, pick up the phone, send the email, do what you need to do to take the first step. There's open arms at ILC. All right. Thanks, Greg and everybody else for being on the webinar today. And uh, we hope you'll uh, sign up for the newsletter at ILC, IntegrativeLifeCenter.com. And for to get new webinar series that we're doing. Thanks for coming today. Thanks Greg again for sharing your story. Thanks.